Hello, I'm Greg Webb, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, Malcolm and Ashley, for inviting me to speak to you today about the trace element geochemistry and carbonate rocks. <clears throat> and in particular, I'm going to give you a sedimentologist's perspective. You know, the tools of choice for me are usually more along the line of having a rock pick or a drilling rig if I can get some funding out in the field, but I'm happy to look at core, I'm happy to look at thin sections with a microscope. But frankly, trace element geochemistry has gotten so useful that I find myself increasingly embracing the bunny suit and I spend some time in other people's clean labs getting some data. So just so you know, I'm not a geochemist. I'm actually a sedimentologist, but I collaborate with some top-notch geochemists and some of these people are here. You'll recognize some. These are all colleagues and collaborators, PhD students and uh, postdocs who have had some input into some of the things I'm going to show you today. <clears throat> so why trace elements? Well, obviously, we use trace elements for dating our carbonates, so uranium, thorium, and lead, quite important. We also are very interested these days in looking at uh, sea surface temperature, so paleothermometry. We're interested in the pH, and so trace elements are great for that in some archives. This is just showing some Archean rocks. This is Balls Camber's work looking at the redox of ancient oceans. Rare earth elements are good for that, and iodine is also quite good for that. And Mark Kendrick at uh, UQ is getting me very interested in the halogens in carbonates as trace elements. We also done an awful lot of work on water quality, and rare earth elements and different elements are good for that, both for temporal records, but also spatial records, and this is some work that uh, Nicole Leonard did. And just year before last now, uh, 2019, Naratam Saha uh, found a new proxy, vanadium, that actually gives you a good proxy for burning and clearing in the catchment, and it's recoverable from parietes corals in the ocean. So we know why we like this, and they're really good, but of course, anyone who works with carbonate rocks knows the first thing you have to do is figure out how good is your sample. And so diagenesis is an ever-present uh, problem. These are some carbonate aeolian dunes on Rottenest Island, and they're undergoing meteoric diagenesis. And of course, this is a real problem for geochemistry. So this is some uh, example of how to just look at that. This is a coral from the last interglacial from Windley Key in Florida, and it's had its meteoric diagenesis caught right in half. And so if you have a look, uh, the lower part that you see down here is nice aragonite. The upper part has been uh, neomorphosed into low magnesium calcite. So you see the beautiful SEM fibrous microstructure behind me that represents uh, original microstructure, good aragonite, and then the blocky calcite spar that you would not want for your geochemistry. So we know about these kind of things. Less commonly known about are some of the early marine diagenesis, and this was from Luke Noderf's PhD, and he looked at live corals actually growing on a reef flat, and Okay, I don't expect you to read this. Read the paper if you get interested, but I'll just show you a couple of highlights. Basically, you already have bioerosion taking place here, and the microborings can be very hard to avoid when you're doing geochemical analyses of these rocks. And of course, sometimes the organic matter in those has different trace element affinities than the carbonate, so you have to be careful. But some of them are also filled with low magnesium calcite. And that's uh, quite a problem and a bit unexpected, but this is out in live corals in seawater. Of course, you also have your typical marine aragonite cement, marine high magnesium calcite cements, including microbialites. But you even get crazy things like brucite in there. This is magnesium hydroxide. So imagine if you sampled a little bit of that, what your magnesium calcium ratio would be like. So just to show you how intimate these are, uh, this is an SEM view within a coral, and you've got high magnesium calcite growing right on top of aragonite, and that's growing on top of brucite, again, that magnesium hydroxide, and all that's growing on top of the coral aragonite, all in this one tiny section, and you can see the scale there. So this is an issue, and we do know that it does affect some of our uh, paleoproxy archives. This is strontium calcium, uh, matched with sea surface temperature in a Cyphastria coral that Naratam Saha uh, published. And you see that it, uh, it's quite a good proxy right up until you get 
uh, up near this diagenetic uh, boring and some other diagenesis, and you start to decouple the strontium calcium from temperature. So these sort of diagenetic effects do uh, affect us even in live collected material. You know, no major late stage diagenesis here. Of course, after that, you've got burial diagenesis. So you might have pressure solution, different cementation, dolomitization, uh, all the way up to metamorphism. And so there's a lot that you might have to take account of. So how do we do that? Well, we try to vet our samples, and you guys all know that, and people have commonly used X-ray diffraction. I'm not a big fan of that, but this is an interesting work, and it, it shows that if you grind your aragonite sample uh, with too much energy, you can actually produce an awful lot of calcite in it. These, these are both the same material, hand ground versus using a ball mill, and the ball mill made 35% uh, low mag calcite out of the initial aragonite. Well, that could give you a problem. Uh, that's not what you really want. Other, excuse me, things. This is some work from James Sadler, and what we have here is a synchrotron X-ray fluorescence map, and it's showing strontium intensity. So, the the typical light gray that you see here, this is uh, the normal coral strontium, but you see that that nice aragonite cement in the pores is much brighter. It has a higher strontium. So, this is all aragonite. But it, it has a, a major problem if you're going to use it in strontium calcium uh, thermometry. Well, our scanning and vetting for corals is getting more and more sophisticated. Richard Murphy has been working with hyperspectral scanning. And what we have here are four different views of the same box of core. And on this side is the interpretation. And this is a core from One Tree Reef in the Great Barrier Reef, where this is the Holocene. Then we have the unconformity to the last interglacial. And the orange that you see here is calcite, but the blue is still aragonite. And you can see that there's good aragonite even down in those 120, 130,000 year old uh, last interglacial corals. So this is a way to vet your material a whole core box at a time. And this is work with Jody Webster and others. And so uh, again, very useful. Uh, the other thing we commonly use are SEM for vetting. And this is just showing some examples. Uh, the one over here is uh, basically coral parites. The good part here, nice microstructure, perfectly good and usable, but these are some of these calcite filled borings that you would not want to analyze. And of course, for dating, we commonly look with SEM. Nice clean coral here, not a lot of cement on. This one looks pretty dirty. You might not want to vet that. So SEM vetting is also very good. So once you get past just vetting your sample, the other things you really have to worry about is what is it you're trying to achieve with it? What are you trying to measure? And what is your sample? This is just a, a patched together view of a, a clean live reef over on the left hand side. So this is Heron Reef patched together with a dead reef uh, inshore in Morton Bay. And so if you're interested in water chemistry from a limestone made in these environments, what you may find is you can get at water chemistry pretty easily in this one. But over here, if you're really interested in the water chemistry, you're going to have to account for a lot of contamination from that terrigenous material. So just another example of that. This is from the 2019 floods in the Great Barrier Reef. And what you have here is a flood plume moving out over the reef. And so if you were looking at a limestone from here, what are you interested in? Are you interested in the clean, water signal, maybe if it's an ancient rock, you're interested in the redox in there. Are you interested in this particular environment? How clean or how dirty is it? Okay, and you might be interested in that. Or you might be interested in what is the dirt itself? What is the contaminant? What's its provenance? Is it from dredging? Is it from a particular catchment? Where did it come from? Okay, so all of these things are things you might want to know. And so it's important to remember that your sample always has several sources of trace elements. So if we look at something like this, we have uh, a, a biological community, either a biofilm or something making a skeleton, and it may have a biosignature where it either increases or decreases particular elements in your final sample. The carbonates are growing from some water, so you'll pick up some geochemistry from the ambient water. There may be some sediment contamination, as we saw there in Morton Bay. And then all of this is going to undergo potentially some kind of diagenesis where a diagenetic fluid may either take elements or add new elements. So you need to be aware of all of that. 
The other thing that is really important to be aware of is that even if you're sure of all of that, you can have situations where you have something that's benthic and it is growing in, say, seawater, and it may represent that ambient water just fine. But as you get down into micro environments of different levels, that water can become evolved away from seawater to something quite different. And proof in the pudding there is when you look at some of Luke's work where you're growing brucite down in these coral cavities, again in live coral that is growing in seawater, uh, the brucite suggests you may have a pH as high as 9 in there. And then finally, we have those little borings that are filled with low magnesium calcite within the aragonite, again growing in seawater. So they're completely unrepresentative of that ambient seawater in terms of their geochemistry. You need to know what it is you're sampling. So bear in mind, almost all carbonate samples are a mixture of some kind. This is just some reef sediment. And uh, you know, forgive me for being so biased that a lot of the material here is from some of my kind of work. But in this sediment, you've got red algae, green algae, coral, mollusks, all kinds of things that have different trace element uh, you know, constitutions, if you like. And uh, just to give you an example from that, these are two live collected forams that grew on that reef flat out of the very same water. And the marginopra, for instance, if we look at their uh, geochemistry, it's a high mag calcite. You can see it's got 11.3 mole percent magnesium carbonate compared to the infestagina that's low mag calcite with only 3.4 mole percent. And the rare earth elements are more than an order of magnitude higher in the margin opera. The barium is almost three times higher and the uranium is about eight times higher. Well, imagine if you do a bulk sample of this. And I review papers occasionally where people are trying to look at bulk sediment samples. Uh, the ratio of these four amps to each other is going to vastly alter your trace element geochemistry. Okay, so it's an important thing to think about and that scaling goes all the way down. This is microbialite, mainly high mag calcite, but you see the bright spots there are aragonite sponge chips from excavation. And this is another X-ray fluorescence map, in this case showing calcium in green and strontium in, uh, or sorry, calcium in red, strontium in green. And so you see the specks of aragonite throughout that material. And so uh, you have to account for these mixtures in terms of what your data are telling you. So how do you do it? Methods. Well, some people have used sequential leaching of different types or leaching in sequences of different acids and so forth. It can get very complicated and sometimes it's really hard to interpret the data you have. Uh, importantly, even if you're using weak acids, elements will commonly desorb from clay contaminants into the weak acid as you dis uh, dissolve a carbonate when you're trying to avoid the siliciclastics. So these are all important things to think about. Now one thing that we have done in the past is use bulk analyses, and this is from Luke Nutter's uh, honors thesis actually. Uh, in this case, we looked at some uh, Devonian reef rock from the Canning Basin, and the little red spots represent a calcium microbe called Renalsis. We've also got beautiful radiaxial uh, fibrous marine cement, and then we have just some sediment in there. And what we've done is we've set up a mixing line where we take the cement to represent what that local seawater would be like, and then uh, uh, on top of that, we've added different percentages of local shale, and then we make this mixing line. And as it turns out, the red renalysis looks a lot like the seawater. It seems to record ambient water, but that sediment looks like it could have up to 0.5% uh, terrigenous detritus in it. And so you can try to work these things back out from a bulk sample. The other thing you can do is try to use laser ablation and get in and just get a more finite sample. And in this case, Balls Cambria and I uh, did some work and drilled some holes in these reanalysis. And we were able to show, for instance, that uh, they're quite enriched in, say, vanadium relative to the other carbonates here. And maybe that's a biosignature. So that's quite an important technique. And you can also do transects with laser ablation. And in this case, you see there's that little spike along the blue dashed line that represents high zirconium, that may be a layer in this Archean stromatolite that has particular contamination in it, and you can recognize it by using a transect of laser ablation. So that's very useful techniques. You also can then use laser ablation mapping where you raster across, and this is some of the earliest work that we did with that. Uh, Balls Camber did this again, uh, and you can see in the, the diagram you've got these little uh, 
rhinalsis-like shapes, and they're full of cerium and manganese and so forth, and you can see them there. If you want to refine that a little better, and this is a sneak peek, but this is a sample again from uh, down Melbourne in the synchrotron of an X-ray fluorescence map, and in this case, strontium is red, iron is green, and the manganese you see is blue. And you'll see all around me there that you've got this beautiful blue rhinalsis. Uh, so potentially that could be some sort of bioelement in there. Now the problem, of course, with XFM is that you can't analyze the really low abundance things using that technique. So enter John Caulfield and Teresa Ubedi, and they've helped me at UQ with some 4 micron pixel mapping, and this is Parides coral. And what you see here, importantly, is that we've got strontium, uh, magnesium, and uranium, and you're talking about the magnesium is uh, more than an order of magnitude, or about an order of magnitude lower in concentration than the strontium, and then several orders of magnitude down you have uranium, all in the same analysis. And you can really see what, where they are in there, and bear in mind this entire thing is about 500 microns. So very low blank, very high sensitivity, it's getting really good, and there are more and more techniques coming to refine things. But you know in the end, as your sample volume gets smaller and smaller, so you can refine what it is your elements are coming from, sooner or later small sample volume times low concentration runs into de detection limits. And there's only so much help you can get from low blank and uh, really high count rates with sensitivity. But bear in mind some elements are easier to use than others, and rare earth elements are really good for this because they're self-normalizing. And what I mean by that, and these are some data again from some of these benthic forams, this one's Calcarina, and what you see over here is just the parts per billion concentration, and rare earths tend to zigzag, uh, adjacent pairs have high and low concentrations. But what we do is we normalize them to a shale standard, and in this case shale is a, a dominant source for uh, rare earths into seawater, and what happens is you get a cohesive behavior because of their similar chemical behavior to each other, and you get a data where each value relates to each other. Well, what that then allows you to do is have expectations about those data. And so this was some work done with Fei Li, and we were looking at Bahamian and Great Salt Lake Owens, and I won't go into all the details, you can look at the paper, but basically we did some laser ablation on these, and you see these tiny spots, kind of 30 to 40 microns, and the data we got starts to look a bit uncohesive. Uh, most geochemists look at this and think, ooh, that's pretty bad. What would you do with that? But the significant thing about this is, because you know that these things are all acting together, they're just not being measured very accurately, that accuracy is a, you know, somewhat random. And so when you can have the values of more than one element together, like an yttrium-holmium ratio, or praseodymium and neodymium to give you a, a cerium anomaly. What happens is, as the concentration increases, the, uh, I guess, value of those analyses gets better and better, and they actually converge on the correct value. So this is a really helpful kind of thing, and you can see that even if you had bad data that any good geochemist would throw out, it can give you an idea of what you actually have there, even from these tiny, tiny analyses. So basically, what I've wanted to get to you is that uh, trace elements are wonderful, but once you vet them, you really need to have a detailed understanding of the actual sample and the biogeochemical processes that are relevant to its formation. You want to have knowledge of the elements themselves and where they're coming from in your sample. You want to know how those elements relate to the environment for which you're trying to find a proxy you want to have the most appropriate technique then to get the data and a good geochemist. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Malcolm and Ashley for inviting me to give this. And thanks for all my colleagues and help. And I'll just leave this for the final seconds uh, on some references in case you want to see a bit more about the talk. Thank you.